Should we start? Okay. Okay, welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to the first uh, De La Pietra lectures this uh, year, 2018. We are honored by the De La Pietra families uh, who are here standing in the first row. They are, in fact, the benefactors who actually fund this series of lectures, as among many other things. And in fact, these lectures have been going on for 20, since 2011, and they keep going strong. We agreed, in fact, one thing is that in the past, perhaps, we were more concentrated on physics and mathematics, but they agreed that perhaps we should extend these lectures to great scientists and intellectuals. So that uh, today, for example, I think it's the first time we have a lecture more on biology and uh, animal lives and so on and so forth. Now, I don't think you came here to listen to me. <laughs> you came to listen to Carl Safina. He's a, a well-known uh, well author. He's one of our, the most prestigious professors in Stony Brook. He's, you can actually go and Google him, and then you can go and watch the uh, television series he made for PBS about the sea. He has written seven books, of which the last one is Beyond Words. And in fact, this is going to be the title of his talks, Professor Safina. Okay, well, thank you very, very much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it, and thank you very much for this series and for inviting me. So tonight we're going to try to, um, we're going to ask and try to answer one question. It's probably a fairly familiar question, and the question is, does my dog really love me, or does she just want a treat? <laughs> How, how many of you have ever asked that question? <laughs> Say, I told you it was a familiar question. Well, we're going to spend the next uh, little while trying to answer that question. And I think that you can see that it's just, it's very, very obvious that our dog really loves us. Isn't it just so obvious you can just look at those little sweet eyes and see, yes, she really loves us? It's obvious, OK? Any questions, that's the end of the lecture, except <laughs> that See, you're glad you're not, you don't have a physicist tonight, because that was easy, right? But um, it's not so easy, because maybe we can't really tell. Maybe we can't really tell what's really going on in those furry little heads. But nothing is going on. So if something is going on, what could that possibly be? And then there's a little bit of another question about us, which is, why is their question about them, do they love us? That's not a question about them. That's a question about us. That's a question about me, right? Do you love me? That's a question about me and my insecurities. So I needed a different question. Otherwise, I couldn't really figure out how to think about this. I needed a different question. And the question was, who are you? That's a very different question than, do you love me? Who are you? That can help us start to maybe open a door. There are capacities of the human mind. We're familiar with these kinds of capacities of the, of the human mind. And the question is, are these capacities of only the human mind? We are on a planet with some other very big brains. What are they doing? What have they been doing? Is it really possible that nothing is going on in those brains? Is it possible they have no minds at all? Well, when I was taught about science and the science of animal behavior and the science of the mind, I was taught that Asking about their minds is not a scientific question because there's no way to answer it. That's what I was taught. And for decades, that was the official scientific answer. But I take issue with that, as many people now do, because there are pretty good ways in. You can look at their brains. You can consider the gathering principle of all of biology, which is evolution. or you can simply watch what they do. This is Joyce Poole. She's a famous 
elephant behavior researcher. And that is not by any stretch an elephant. It's obviously a very big jellyfish. So why does Joyce have a jellyfish? Because jellyfish had the first neurons in the world. And then jellies gave rise eventually to chordates, and chordates became vertebrates or gave rise to vertebrates, and then vertebrates came on land and built auditoriums and did all the things that we do. <laughs> it's a short history. I, I'm leaving stuff out. <laughs> but it's true that a neuron is still a neuron, whether it's in a jellyfish or a frog, a turtle or a dog, a chimpanzee or you, a nerve cell is pretty much the same thing still. So what does that mean for the experience of the world that is experienced by something like a frog or, let's say, a crayfish? What does that mean if they have neurons just like us? Maybe it means absolutely nothing at all. I'm not really sure. That question isn't so easy to answer one way or another. But it turns out that if you have crayfish in a tank, and every time they come out and try to look for food, you give them a tiny little electrical shock, they will develop what looks like a nervous disorder. They will, they will look like they have anxiety disorder, and they will stop coming out, and they'll just hide all the time. But if you put into their water the same kind of drug that is used to treat anxiety disorder in human beings, they will relax and come out. Now, that's pretty interesting, and it certainly suggests that maybe they have an experience of the world. So how do we honor the possibility of crayfish anxiety? We boil them by the millions. Octopuses are mollusks. They're in the same phylum as clams. And yet they can use tools as well as most apes, and they recognize individual human faces. And how do we honor the ape-like intelligence of these invertebrates? We boil them also. There are fish called groupers. And groupers, if, um, if a grouper chases a prey fish into a crevice, a moray eel is sleeping. They have a way of signaling to the moray, follow me. The moray understands that signal, and often the moray will follow the grouper. The grouper then will go to where the fish is hiding and will say to the moray, it's in here. The moray will then go in, and sometimes the moray catches the fish, and sometimes the fish bolts out, and the grouper catches the fish. This is an ancient interspecies partnership. Interspecies partnerships are pretty rare. And it's probably been going on for millions of years. But we have only known about it for about 13 years. And when I say we, I mean the 16 of us who read that paper. <laughs> and how do you think we honor the ancient interspecies partnership of the grouper and the moray? Anybody want to answer? I hear boiled. No, that is wrong. It's, it's fried. <laughs> well, I think that you can easily see that a pattern is emerging about animal minds. And unfortunately, this pattern says a lot more about our minds than it does about theirs. One of the things it says is that we don't really spend much of our brain power thinking about them. And by extension, thinking about the world we're in or the planet we're on. Hmm. We're at a university. A university is built more or less mainly on teaching. And teaching is when you stop doing what you're doing to take time away from what you're doing to show your child or your companion how to do something. That's what's called a teaching load. You're not getting your own stuff done. It turns out that sea otters teach. Chimpanzees do not teach. They learn a lot by watching, but the ones who are doing, they don't stop to teach. But they teach, 
And killer whales do some very, very complicated teaching. And killer whales share almost everything that they catch with the members of their family. If you look at the human brain, you see a couple of um, interesting things. One is there's a mouse on the left, clearly labeled. And you can see that our brain is basically an elaborated mammalian brain, right? It's, it's, like, a, it's like a complicated mouse brain. If you look at the human brain and a chimpanzee brain, what you see is that the human brain is basically a large chimpanzee brain. And it's a good thing ours is larger because we are also the most insecure of all the apes. <laughs> but uh-oh, that's a dolphin. What does that tell us? Well, it's a more elaborated mammalian brain, and it's bigger. That's kind of interesting. But that may say nothing about their intellect or mental experience. It's possible that a lot of that is given over to the analysis of sounds and their sonar. That's a possibility. We don't exactly know. But it's certainly a little intriguing and a little intimidating that they have a bigger, more complicated brain. So we don't want to look at that too long. We'll get uh, complex. <laughs> we can see brains, but where does this leave us? We cannot see the mind. However, we can see the workings of minds in the logic of behaviors. And so if you look at this scene, I'm pretty sure that all of you instantly make sense of this scene in the correct way. I'm pretty sure none of you thinks that the big ones have just stomped the little ones to death. <laughs> but here's the thing. Your mind is making sense of this exactly the same way their mind is. Because look what they've done. They have chosen, they've chosen a patch of shade under the palm trees to let their babies go to sleep. While the adults doze, they let their guards down, but not off. They are still vigilant. They're facing outward, and they're touching each other. Long time. That's why. Those elephants were obviously very relaxed. Do these elephants look relaxed to you? No. And that's because they're not at all relaxed. They're alarmed. What might they be alarmed about? Well, it turns out that people have done some experiments. They've recorded humans in three different languages saying, look, there are some elephants. Those languages are English, Kamba, which are farmers, and Maasai, like him, who are herders. And you notice that he has a spear. When the elephants hear it in English, when it's played through a speaker hidden in bushes, so it has no scent and there's no visual, it's through a hidden speaker. When the elephants hear it in English, they don't do anything. When they hear it in Kamba, they don't do anything. And when they hear it in Maasai, they bunch up and then they run away. Why is that? Because people speaking English are tourists and they don't bother elephants. The Kamba farmers don't bother elephants and the Maasai run their herds through the same bush that elephants live in. They get into confrontations around water holes, and often the elephants get hurt with those spears. The elephants know not only that there are different kinds of animals and some of them are humans, they know that there are different kinds of humans and some of them are dangerous and some of them are OK. They understand that. They've been watching us more closely than we've been watching them. They understand us better than we understand them. They know who they are, where they are, and what they need to do. As mammals, our imperatives are basically all the same. Find food, try to stay alive, and try to keep your babies alive. All of our lives are basically those things. We have that in common. We happen to look different on the outside, but on the inside, we're almost exactly the same. We have the same bones, we have the same organs, we have the same hormones, we have the same nervous system. 
Some of us are outfitted for hiking in the hills of Africa. Some of us are outfitted for diving in the deep ocean. Whales, in their front flippers, have exactly the same bones you have in your hands, because we are very, very, very closely related. So we see recognizable things that come from the mammalian imperative if we are social animals, like we are and they are. We see helping where help is needed. We see curiosity as the young ones learn the world. We see the deep bonds of family affection. And even when they're not so closely related to us, we recognize affection. Dancing is dancing. And then we ask a really strange question. We say, yeah, but are they conscious? <laughs> I don't understand why we're still asking that question, because what is consciousness? Consciousness is the thing that feels like something. When you get general anesthesia, it makes you what? <laughs> Unconscious. You don't experience anything. Then you come out of it and you regain. So why would we ask if creatures that have eyes that they see with, ears that they hear with, and play with each other, recognize individuals, and run around, why would we still ask, but they are, are they even conscious? That's a really strange question. Here's the answer. OK, they are. If you look at all of these topics that have to do with how animals think and feel, like I did when I was writing a whole book about it, you come up against this um, kind of funny thing, which is there are some people who, there are a lot of people actually in this field, who have tried to zero in on the one thing that makes us human. And it's kind of like a Mad Libs game. It's kind of like blank noun makes us human. And different people have different competing ideas because they're trying to make a reputation on being the ones that have total. Does it is empathy makes us human. Most of the people who say things like that don't really spend a lot of time actually watching animals. They think they just kind of know about animals in a dismissive way, and they come up with the thing that makes us human. Well, what is empathy? Empathy is the ability of your mind to match the mood of your companion or your companions. If you're just sitting there and somebody you know comes in all happy, it puts you in a nice mood. If they come in and they look shocked and upset about something, you're suddenly concerned. That's empathy. Empathy is mood matching. And the earliest kind of empathy is contagious fear. So anything that lives with others of their kind, any social animal, and many animals that don't even live in groups, have the ability to have empathy. Because when it's time to hurry up, you better hurry up. You need to match that mood right away. If you're on the beach with 300 of your friends and all of them fly away, suddenly it doesn't pay for you to say, gee, I wonder why everybody just left. <laughs> I'm sure that's been tried. It didn't work, and it's gone. So I sort of think of empathy as this range of things. Basic empathy is what I've been talking about, feeling with another. Then a slight remove from that is what I call sympathy. You don't feel what they feel, but you understand it. Um, you could say, well, I'm really sorry to hear that your great grandmother passed away. You understand that? You don't have the same grief as if you're a family member, because you're not a family member. Uh, even our dogs, you go, ow! Your dog comes over. What happened? That's a kind of sympathy, very simply expressed. And then if you try to act, to do something in a crisis, I call that compassion. All right, These are familiar words. This is just what I mean when I talk about it on this sliding scale of types of empathy. Far from being the thing that makes us human, human empathy is far from being perfected. For one thing, we take empathic animals and we round them up and we eat them. And if you say, well, that's just, you know, that's, 
that's not fair, because in this culture we don't eat dogs. Why are you doing it with dogs? Uh, this is just predation anyway. It's not the same thing as murder. Well, we're not really so great to human beings either. We have a long way to go. If empathy is what makes us human, we have a long way to go to be fully human. Here's another thing I was taught you must never, ever do. This awkward, awkward word, anthropomorphism. People who know one thing about animal behavior seem to know this word. And they know you must never do this. You must never attribute human emotions to other animals. But what if those other animals feel the same kinds of emotions? And where, where do our emotions come from? So is it really possible that we're the only ones who feel anything at all when you see these obvious behaviors all the time? It's simply not scientific to say when they're eating, oh, they're hungry. And when their tongues are hanging out, oh, they're exhausted. And when they're rolling around in the mud with their kids, you say, oh, I don't even know if they can experience anything. Because you're too afraid to say, look, they're happy. Oh, we, how do we know an elephant could be happy? Well, how do we know a lion could be hungry? Isn't that a bigoted kind of a thing? Isn't that a tremendous bias that we have? And why is it that we refuse to attribute anything nice to their mental experience? Why is that? Because it spoils our favorite story. What's our favorite story? We're the only ones that really matter. That's our favorite story. All right, so I was kind of going on and on about stuff like this to uh, a person who was interviewing me for a book review right after this book came out. And she said that other animals can think and feel. And I thought, well, gee, I thought I was doing a good job explaining it. <laughs> e either you got a problem or I got a problem. I'm not sure. But um, all right, so there's a disconnect here. Let me, let me try to frantically rifle through the 600 references in the book to come up with the best example. And then I realized the answer was right there on the floor. When my puppy gets up off the floor and comes over to me and rolls over on her back. First of all, she doesn't get up on the floor, off the floor and go to the sofa and roll over on her back or go to the dining room table and roll over on her back. She comes over to me and rolls over on her back. And that's because she just had a thought. And the thought is, I'd like my belly rubbed. And I'm going to him. And I'm making myself completely vulnerable because, first of all, I know we're family. I trust him a thousand percent. I know he understands what I'm asking for when I roll over like this. And I know that he knows how to do it and make it feel good. <laughs> so she has just thought and she has just felt. And in a way, it's really not a lot more complicated than that. When we see other animals, what we do is we paste a label on them right away. We say, oh, look, elephants. And then we think, OK, we saw elephants. We're done with elephants. Oh, look, whales. Oh, those are wolves. That's how we see them. That's not how they see each other. That tall, finned male, uh, first of all, these are all in a, in a group called the J-Pod. They live in the waters off the west coast off Washington Strait. I photographed these in Harrow Strait off Washington State. And um, he was 36 years old when I took this photograph. And that female on his left is his sister, who, is, uh, who was 40, 42 or 44 when I took the photograph. And the point is, they have known each other for decades. They know exactly who they are. They've been together all their lives. They have traveled thousands of miles together. They swim about 75 miles every day. When they are separated by miles, 
in seawater with 30-foot visibility, they recognize each other's voices and can easily find each other again. This is a young, uh, an adolescent male elephant. His name is Philo. This is him in Samburu Reserve in Kenya. And he is showing a little jauntiness. He's just at the age where he's very recently left his family. Males leave the families. All the females stay together in their families. The males leave, and they have a sort of a different kind of life. Um, and he's just starting that independent life, life with males, life outside the family. So that's him, and that's him four days later. Humans are not only capable of experiencing grief, we generate an unbelievable amount of it. We want to carve those teeth. Why can't we wait for them to die? The teeth would be bigger anyway. In Roman times, African elephants lived from the shores of the Mediterranean to the Cape of Good Hope. When I was a young man, they still occupied gigantic, continuous swaths of Central and Eastern Africa. Now they live in tiny, separated, shrinking shards of range. This is the geometry of the greatest creature on land being driven extinct because we want to carve their teeth. Of course, park, park rangers were paid to completely exterminate the wolves, and those were some of the very last wolves that lived south of Canada. They were completely exterminated in the 1920s. They were completely missing until the 1990s. After about a 20-year fight, wolves were trapped in Canada and brought to Yellowstone and released. In those 60 years, animals like elk and deer had completely overpopulated. Everything was out of balance in Yellowstone. The wolves came in. They started doing what wolves do, not only being predators, but also their kills providing food for things like ravens and magpies, like you see in the picture there, and eagles and bears and things like that. And then a whole new kind of tourism industry sprung up, which is many people go to Yellowstone just to see the wolves. It's the best place in the world to see free-living wolves, and people spend about the people who go only to see the wolves spend about $30 million a year to go to Yellowstone to see wolves. <clears throat> there was one um, very well-observed, very well-known family there in, the, in a place in the northern part of the park called the Lamar Valley. It was called the Lamar Pack. The, uh, well, I should say, first of all, a pack of wolves is a nuclear family. The alpha male and alpha female, those are the mom and dad. All the rest of the wolves are their children from about the last two to three years. When the children get to be adolescents, they leave and try to find their own stake in life, exactly like in our families, where we have our moms and dads and our kids of different ages, but when they get to be adolescents, they feel the imperative to leave. We might suggest that that would be a good idea at times. <laughs> so the mother of this family was the most famous wolf in the world because she was an incredible hunter, very well watched, well loved by the wolf watchers. Um, they had a terrific story. And a few months before I got there, just about three months before I got there, somebody in Congress highlighted the word wolf in the Endangered Species Act, and then they hit the delete key. And wolves went from 100% protected to 
completely unprotected outside of Yellowstone in Wyoming. There is no fence or border or wall there. And these wolves knew how to live the way that they had been living. And as soon as they put a paw outside the park, they started getting shot. The mother was probably the only non-human that ever got an obituary in the New York Times. That's how well known she was. And what happened was that this family that had been such a, um, such a tight unit started to disintegrate. So even though this picture looks kind of cute, what's actually happening here is that that wolf on the bottom, she is the prodigy of the family, the most precocious one, and she is being kicked out of her family by her two jealous sisters. Now, I can't say for sure that they felt jealous, but that's exactly the way they treated her. And I watched this with my own eyes. She tried for days to get back in with her family. But what had happened was her mother was dead, her uncle was dead, the family was falling apart, the sisters turned on each other, they turned on her, they ganged up on that one who's upside down and drove her out. There she is on the left. Where was her father through all of this? He was roaming around. He was probably looking for his mate, looking for his brother. He went back to the place where they had been shot. And his whole family fell apart. So what happened was she, she was about uh, four years old. And I thought, well, you know, like in a year, she would have left anyway. She should be fine. He was nine years old. That's exceptionally old for a wolf in Yellowstone. He lost, going into winter, his family. That means his hunting support. He also lost his territory. He had no place to live, nobody to help him hunt. And I thought, well, a nine-year-old male wolf going into winter with nothing is doomed. He lost everything a wolf can have. So what actually happened was he's still alive. In three years, he put his life back together somehow. He found a new mate. They carved out a new territory. They had pups. The point is, they have lives. They're not just numbers. It's not just six wolves. It's things that happen to them. And when we do things to them, the trajectory of their lives can be changed. The survivors can suffer more than the ones who get killed. They are individuals. We hurt them so much. The, the mystery to me is why they, they don't hurt us more than they do. This killer whale had just finished eating a young gray whale that he and his companions had killed. They had just finished feeding on this whale that they had killed. They pose absolutely no danger to those people in that boat. Um, who include two of the uh, most famous killer whale researchers, actually. That whale, his name is T20. I had just watched him tear a seal into three pieces with two of his companions. That seal weighed probably about the same as each of those people in that boat. And those people have absolutely nothing to fear because no free-living killer whale has ever hurt a person. This, to me, is a strange mystery. They eat seals. Why don't they eat people? Why can we trust them around our toddlers? Why no grudge? Two scientists have uh, each, each in two different countries have a very similar story about killer whales. It, it goes like this. I'll tell you one of them. They're almost identical. They were following some killer whales because they were doing behavioral research and they were trying to track them and see where they went. And this was a long time ago before GPS tags and things like that. If you wanted to know where they go, you had to follow them around in a boat. They had been following them around in a boat for a long time, or, uh, at least a day. It may have been overnight. I can't quite remember that part. They were pretty far from home. The whales went into, the whales were being a little evasive. They, they seemed like they didn't really want the people around or the noise of the boat. Uh, and then the whales went into a fog bank and they said, all right, well, that didn't work out so well. It's time to go home. So 
They uh, put the cameras away, let's go home, look at the compass, power up the boat, and three minutes later, all the whales are back, and now they're in front of the boat. And they thought, well, that's pretty interesting. Let's just see where they want to go. So they followed them for about 15 miles, and suddenly they burst out of the fog, and the researcher's house was right there on the shoreline, and the whales turned around and left. <laughs> now, two different people in two different countries have almost the exact same story. In the Bahamas, there's a researcher named Denise Herzing, and she studies these spotted dolphins. She knows them all by name. Um, she knows who is whose aunt, who is whose baby, um, and all of those kinds of relationships. She knows them very well. One day, she went there. I've actually been on her boat, so I know what the boat is like. Um, it's set up as a liveaboard. There's a few bedrooms. There's a galley. Uh, every day you try to find the dolphins. When you find them, you try to get in the water and photograph the behaviors and what's going on. So she's been doing that for a long time. One day, they're getting ready to get in the water. They've sighted the dolphins. They've just arrived. They've sighted the dolphins uh, in the Bahamas. And uh, the dolphins, instead of coming to the boat and bow riding like they often do, they're acting very, very skittish, and they're avoiding the boat, and she's saying, what in the world is wrong with the dolphins today? And somebody suddenly comes up from down below and announces that a person on board had died during a nap in his bunk. Now, how in the world might dolphins possibly know that one of the human hearts had stopped, and why would that spook them? Why would they care about something like that? Various questions, but I do know one thing that it means. One thing that it means is that there seems to be much, much more going on in the other minds that are on this planet than we have ever bothered to even try to think about. In an aquarium in South Africa, there was a little baby bottlenose dolphin named Dolly. And uh, one day, one of the guys who worked at the aquarium was on a break. And he was outside their tank. There was a big window. He was watching through the window. And he was smoking a cigarette, just relaxing, watching the dolphins in there. And little Dolly, the nursing age bottlenose dolphin, came over to the window. She watched him for a minute. And she just went back to her mother and resumed nursing. And then she came back to the window and she released all the milk and it enveloped her head like a cloud of smoke. <laughs> now it seems as though a nursing infant dolphin had an idea. I'm going to use milk to somehow represent whatever that guy is doing. And when humans use one thing to represent something else, we call it art. The things that make us human are not the things that we tell ourselves make us human. I'll tell you what I think it is. Everything about us, you can find representations and reflections and other examples of in other animals. But humans are the extreme animal. We are the most compassionate, and the cruelest, and the most creative, and by far the most destructive animal that has ever been on this earth. And we are all of those things all the time, all jumbled up together. We are the extreme animal. We're not the only ones who feel. We're not the only ones who care. We're not the only ones who care about our mates or our families or our children. Albatrosses live on the, they nest on the most remote islands in the great oceans of the world. This is a Laysan albatross feeding a chick that's about four or five months old. And this is literally the passing of life from one generation to the next. We have a word called sacred. We apply it to things like buildings and books. 
If that word means anything, I think it's a, applicable to the continuity of life, the passing of life from one generation to the next. I would say this is a sacred thing. That island is Laysan Island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and that's what it looks like. It looks like a dump. We have no idea they're there, but they sure know about us. Those birds may travel a month and maybe go anywhere from six to 10,000 miles to come back and deliver one meal to their chick. And nowadays, it includes things like the screw top to a peanut butter jar. Nowadays, basically, all of the albatrosses have plastic in them. It doesn't always kill them. It's never good for them. And sometimes it does kill them. This is an albatross that's about five months old, was ready to fly, and it died. And it was packed with red cigarette lighters. This is not the relationship we're supposed to have with the rest of the living world. It's not the relationship we want to have. It's not even the relationship we know about, but it is the one we do have. This is not just me saying it. This is pain and death to many other creatures. And when we are expecting new human life, we paint animals on the nursery room walls. We don't paint cell phones. We don't paint work cubicles. We paint animals. I think most of us have no idea why we paint animals, but I think that subconsciously, it's an incredible thing. And I think that what it is, is that subconsciously we're saying to our new, we're not alone, we have company. And yet, every one of those animals, in every depiction of Noah's Ark, animals we think are certainly deemed by the Creator worthy of salvation, they are all endangered now, and their flood is the tide of us. Not all human cultures have had this kind of relationship with life. Other cultures have seen the deep, deep connections that are our true relationship with other living things. Other cultures try to transform into animals that are respected as being more powerful more capable of minute sensing, having supernatural, superhuman abilities that are worth emulation and magic that may come and give us advice. But that's our relationship with those same animals. If you look at, let's say you wanted to look at the status of all the species in the world, OK? It's impossible, because there are millions. There are probably tens of millions of species. But what would be a proxy for all the species in the world? Well, they all live in habitats. So let's ask the question, what is the extent and the health of all the different habitats? What is the health of coral reefs? What is the extent of forests? What's the extent of grasslands? What's the quality of water? 
How are fish populations in the ocean? And the answer you come up with is they're all at the lowest level in the worst shape they've ever been. And that means something that I find both shocking and horrifying and also incredibly shameful since we pride ourselves and we've named ourselves after the wisdom that comes with our brain. And, and the shocking thing is this. At this point in history, human beings seem to be incompatible with life on Earth. That's a terrible thing to have on our resume, but it's something we're capable of realizing, and it's something that, in theory anyway, we should be capable of changing. Already now, the ocean is acidifying enough to kill larval clams and oysters, especially on the west coast. It has pretty much wiped out oyster hatcheries on the west coast. Well, what must it be doing to wild oysters? We are really changing the world. This is Alaska. You can go to the wildest places, national parks along the coast, doesn't matter. We're everywhere. Our trash is every place. This is Katmai National Park. I went there and we took four tons of trash off the beach in a couple of hours. It's a national park. I don't know why I had to do it. The first oil wells rigs were harpoons. And as you can see, that's a color photograph. This is not the old days of Moby Dick in the early 1800s. That was the 1970s. More whales were killed in the 1960s than in the 1800s. A lot of little whales that were killed then should still be swimming around in the ocean with us today. But those people were not thinking about us. They were only thinking about themselves then. Is there anything that we can learn from that? There's a huge debate over fossil fuels, decarbonizing all of that stuff. And we're told, but oil is cheap. Coal is cheap. We have to get it because it's cheap. Well, the cost, the value, and the price of things are really three different things. Coal may be cheap, but it is very, very costly. And the costs include things like burying a few miners every now and then, um, creating thousands more cases of asthma, blowing the tops off of mountains, acidifying the ocean, and warming the atmosphere. Those are the costs of coal, but it's cheap. So we're told we still have to use it and actually use more of it. Well. Maybe we can do better. Maybe this doesn't have to be the picture of us. The people of the Pacific Northwest believed that there was a clam shell on the beach, and Raven came and turned the clam shell over, and from that, all humanity came forth. That's a very, very different creation story than the one we tell ourselves. It's not the human condition to be at war with life on Earth. It's a cultural thing. Not every culture had that. So this is one way that we think of ourselves. Things have been going on for a long time. There's been evolution, and we're at the top. Here's another way that we think of ourselves. These are just different depictions. So up here, we're at the top again with pterodactyls. Oddly enough, it is very strange uh, to make a tree that looks like that. Here's another tree um, 
basically the things that lead to us are more or less at the top. Charles Darwin is pretty close to the top. We're sort of teamed up here with chimpanzees. These are all ways we try to grasp our relationship in the world. This is actually a more realistic depiction of all of it. It's good to think of it this way because the details are very, very, very hard to grasp. This is over a very, very long period of time, and a lot of the things that evolved long ago are still here with us. We're not at the front of the pack of life. There's a lot here along with us. That's what the whole thing kind of looks like. It's completely mind-boggling. The human mind cannot really get wrapped around the world we're in. This is a scientific way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is we're in an incomprehensible miracle. And we can't really afford to think of it that way. Because if we realized every moment of every day that we live in this inexplicable, shimmering miracle, we would never go to the bank. We would never get our food shopping done. We would never prepare for class. We have to shut ourselves down and close it all out so we can just do stuff we think we have to do. But it's good to keep this in mind and remind ourselves of it every now and then. That's the world. It should blow us away. Actually, that's bird things. It very quickly escapes our ability to get a handle on it, really, emotionally. We can make lists and things like that. This guy is a famous guy. His name is Aldo Leopold, and he was a scientist and uh, an ecologist. And he said, land is a community. That's a concept of ecology. Well, that's a scientific fact. It turns out that from scientific facts about the world come ethical implications. Science teaches us what the ethics should be. And mainly it should be, we should love the world. He said this. I say this. There are different ways to look at it. So a long time ago, we started this talk with a question, do they love us? And we're going to end by inverting that question and ask ourselves whether we have the mental and emotional capacity to simply let them, this says, exist on Earth. Are we capable of that? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Should take some, a few questions, maybe? Absolutely. <laughs> questions or comments? I could add to the uh, motion we lost our uh, beloved dog on January 5th, but in his uh, short life, he was a rescue. He uh, initiated and invented a game that he brought to me. And, he, you know, the timing of it, everything was on his terms. 
and uh, it was amazing. So I, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. I've heard it said that cats cannot really develop relation with humans, but dogs can. And there seems to be research on that. Uh, can you comment on that? Uh, do you own a cat? <laughs> I did. I, I did. You did? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, well, dogs, as I mentioned, well, first of all, um, I guess the most basic thing that I often sort of neglect to re explain is that all dogs are domesticated wolves. Okay, domestication means that genetically the, the plant or the animal has been changed by, mostly by human breeding from its wild form. The ancestors of all dogs are wolves. And uh, their Latin name, actually, the dog's Latin name is changed back to Canis lupus, which is wolf. Um, Wolves live in nuclear families. They understand that relationship instinctively and intrinsically. It's the way they lived since long before there were human beings. And that's why we have dogs in our house. Uh, you know, dogs first became domesticated, probably they self-domesticated by hanging around human camps and caves and things like that. So imagine. 30 or 40,000 years ago, uh, a camp or a cave, there are, there are wolves, they're semi tame lying around the floors, chewing on bones, bones scattered around our floors for the, for the dogs. We have dogs in our house because wolves understand nuclear families. We don't have chimpanzees in our house, our closest relatives, because they don't understand nuclear families. They can't get along with us. Dogs can. Cats do not live in groups. And cats do not form those kinds of relationships. Cats can be tame. Some of them can be warm and affectionate. But, th but they're very different than dogs. No, no amount of treating them the same will make a cat act like a dog. And dogs automatically act like they're part of your family, because that's what they do. Thank you for coming in. Right your some time ago. I'm so excited. Do you, want, do you want to wait for the uh, microphone so everybody can hear? I actually came across your book some time ago, and I was so excited when I saw that you were going to be speaking, and it's, it was even better than I thought it could be, and I love the book. Oh, great. Well, thank I, you. One of the, the, the theories I've read that separate people from the animals is that, that people can think about the fact that they think which I think is a curse frequently, <laughs> actually, the, the fact that you can ruminate and just and go over and go over things. Do you ever get the sense in your studies that, that animals think about their thinking, that they have that type of consciousness that... that well, I, I don't... That's something I don't know how you would know if they can think about their thinking. I mean, um, a lot of people say, well, humans are the only ones who can think about their thinking, but... Then they also say, well, you can't, you can't even talk about animal thinking because you can't know what they're thinking. So if you can't know what they're thinking, how can you say what they can't be thinking? Another weird thing is we say, oh, the reptilian part of my brain is the one that made me get so angry. The reptilian part of my brain made me get out of control. Oh, reptiles have no emotional experience. They have, uh, they have no mental experience. So how, how could the reptilian part of our brain be driving our emotions if reptiles don't have any emotions? So we're, we're all full of all these inconsistencies. They're very obvious. We don't really tend to think about them. But First of all, Carl, thank you so much. That was very inspirational. Uh, it leaves me feeling like the ceiling painter, try, speaking now, the ceiling painter going to work after seeing the Sistine Chapel. Um, you make a, wonderful, a very strong case for appreciating, for having compassion for animals. And you also point out the, the cruelty that we, with which we often treat animals. Um, I'm curious, and, and a great case for the compassion, for, for making a case for compassion for animals. And I don't mean this in a contentious way, but out of true curiosity. Are you a, veg are you a vegan? And if not, how do you justify uh, eating animals? OK.
All right, so um, let me try to do this kind of quickly because it's a little bit of a long thing. Strictly speaking, I'm not vegan. I don't want my money to help drive animal farming at all. So I don't buy meat. Um, I virtually never buy animal products to eat. Um, maybe once or twice a year. I might get some cheese if we're having company. We have chickens. They lay fantastic eggs and they're fantastic chickens. Um, we love to take great care of them and let them run around the yard as much as they want. So strictly speaking, we're not vegan. I also, I do fish. I kill fish. I go clamming. Um, those are animals too. But I don't like to drive animal farming because I think that while uh, living and dying in predation is very, very common in nature, the way we farm animals is to make them live far more miserably than we make them die. So personally, I don't want to have anything to do with that. If I'm at somebody's house and there's some meat going around on a tray, sometimes I will eat it. I don't think that that is the end of the world. I don't really like to be religious or too perfect um, or too precious about anything. So I have, I have those um, minor exceptions, but I don't want to drive animal agriculture either. It's important to understand that even if you're not driving animal agriculture, uh, farms occupy land that used to grow wild animals. Uh, vegetable farms are drenched in pesticides. You know, you can go many, many layers into this and try to figure out how best to eat because there's no perfect way of eating and having no effect on the world. That, that is not possible. And as I heard somebody on, on the radio uh, say, uh, he said, I I'll eat anything as long as I feel bad about it. So I thought that was funny. I, I won't eat anything. I, I am pretty choosy. Um, we try to get organic. Uh, a question I like to ask is, would you kill it? I'm OK killing a fish. I wouldn't want to kill a cow. I wouldn't do it. So I shouldn't eat cow. I mean, I pose this with people. People seem to, some people say it falls into two camps. They say, oh, yeah, that would be totally hypocritical. If you wouldn't kill a pig, you should never eat pork. And other people say, what do you, what do you mean? I don't have to kill a pig. I can just go buy some pork chops. They don't, they don't understand the thing about like the hypocrisy test. But to me, it's a major watershed in my mind. I'm OK with killing fish. I wouldn't want to kill a pig or a cow. I wouldn't even want to shoot a deer. I'm OK if people want to shoot deer. Um, so there's a lot of layers to that. Seasonal and local is better. There are real farmers. It's better to get stuff from them if you can. How they grow their food or even animals matters. You can grow animals and have them have a nice life and suddenly die, or you can have them have a miserable, miserable existence and then get slaughtered in a factory. Um, so all of these things, I think, matter. Sustainability matters. There's all different levels. It's, it's cruelty, it's sustainability, it's who you're supporting, it's all that kind of stuff. So that's my uh, semi-long answer to that question. Yes, we, OK. Thank you very much for coming. Um, what do you think about uh, dog language? And uh, do you think that dogs, um, when they bark, what kind of language do they have? And do they, can they communicate with one another? Yeah, that's a really interesting um, area. I mean, it's not even a question. It's a whole area. F first of all, the last thing you asked is, can they communicate with one another? So communicate means there is a signal that is received by a receiver in an appropriate way that is meant by the signal. And you don't even have to be alive to communicate. Um, Non-living things can communicate. We make those. There are plants that may have absolutely no conscious experience communicate like crazy. They're constantly sending and receiving signals and acting on them in their way that may be completely mechanical, chemical mechanical. Um, and many, many animals communicate a lot. What they don't seem to have is a complex 
language, I'm going to put quotes around language because what I mean by language is the definition that says it's language if it has syntax and grammar. Syntax means um, where in a sentence it is changes the meaning. So syntax is why a Venetian blind is different from a blind Venetian. Okay. <laughs> Um, very few animals have anything like that kind of language, but many animals communicate all kinds of stuff all the time. Our dogs communicate a lot to each other. They communicate a lot to us. I frequently am writing in my, uh, in my writing cottage, which is in, in, the, in the back of our yard, and I can tell by the way the dogs are barking usually if they're playing. Often they, they growl and bark very aggressively. sounds like they're fighting, but I can tell if they're playing. I can tell if there's an intruder. I can tell if the intruder is likely to be a person nearby, like a delivery person next door, or another animal in the form of somebody walking a dog past the house, or um, yesterday we had a stray dog in the yard. Uh, that's very unusual. Our dogs have completely on their own, they've learned somehow uh, that, well, let me just say, hawks pose absolutely no threat to dogs, and yet our dogs bark like crazy at hawks because we have chickens and they seem to have observed, I didn't watch this happen, but they seem to have observed that the hawks are dangerous to chickens. We've had a few attacks. So they, they go crazy if they see a hawk. Um, yesterday an interesting thing happened, which is um, that appeared, one of our chickens started alarming. My wife was in the house, I was in the cottage, the dogs went crazy, she let them out, the dogs were barking at the, we, we have no actual fence, they have an electric fence, so they're barking at the border at the other dog. So I, so I said to my wife, um, as I saw that she let the dogs out, uh, I said, what made you let the dogs out? There's a stray dog. She said, well, the, the, chicken, was alar the chicken was alarming and the dogs went nuts. I said, well, wh wh how was the chicken sounding? I didn't quite hear. He says, Oh, the usual sound that they make, that clucking sound that they make, like when they come out after they lay an egg, the same sound. But to the dogs, it was not the same sound because they almost never react to the chickens when they come out and make what seems to us like the same call. And then later in the day, I was back at my writing desk and I had the dogs in the cottage at that point and I hear the chicken making the call that I think means, I just laid an egg, where is everybody? And, but the dogs were going crazy and jumping at the door. They heard a difference in the call. To me, it sounded like the, the normal call that they each make every day. The dogs heard a difference. They were jumping at the door. I opened the door. They went running out. And there was a red-tailed hawk that had come kind of low down in a tree over a dense bush where all the chickens were cowering. And they, you know, they foiled this attack because they heard the difference in the chickens and they feel like they're responsible for guarding the chickens because they grew up with them as little, little chicks. They kind of feel like, I think they kind of feel like they're their pups in a way. You know, they've known them since they were little and they feel a proprietary feeling. It's amazing, really, you know. But I don't hear the difference in the chickens' call, but they, they do. And I would... And they don't have to, but they, they've done that. So it's not language, but there's a lot of communicating. Hi, thank you so much for coming. It's, I enjoyed your lecture incredibly. I do have almost two very small questions for you. Could you perhaps elaborate on how you feel about the dogs being descendant from wolves? Because I do understand they, the dogs that we have now and the wolves that we have now in our world are descendant from a common ancestor, but your chihuahua is not the gray wolf that's at Yellowstone. So I, I'm a veterinary professional and I do behavior yeah. work. And, okay. and so I hear that a lot from my clients and my um, patients and things like that that I see are not the same and there is a disconnect. And yes. I do have a question as to the canis lupus thing because lupus is a genus and from my understanding, not no, a species. No, lupus is the species. It Can is. Canis is the genus. But, but that doesn't really matter. What, what, what matters is that the direct ancestors of dogs were gray wolves, full stop. They didn't have a common ancestor. The wolves that are out there now, the gray wolves that are out there now, there's different species of wolves actually. It kind of gets very complicated, especially in eastern North America. But gray wolves are the ancestors of dogs, period. Now, the thing is, what is a species? 
The, there is no definition of species that works across all living things. The best definition of species that works for animals, and it doesn't work for all animals, is groups that will freely mate with other groups when they meet are the same species. Chihuahuas will not freely mate with gray wolves. So <laughs> genetically, they really are, in that sense, in, in the kind of taxonomy called cladistics, they are the same species, but in an, any operational way, they're not. They're farther apart than some wild subspecies or even what's considered wild good different species that actually hybridize because speciation in evolution is not a event, it's, it's a process. So where we are in our little snapshot of the world, we see things where that process is long finished and really clear and others are almost there and it's a little fuzzy or they're in the middle of it and it's very fuzzy. And with dogs it's a little complicated because we really put the foot down on the accelerator of their evolution when we took the dogs that domesticated themselves and started breeding all these crazy breeds out of them. So I would say that really we most dogs. That's what I would say. My other just quick question is you had said that you have an electric fence for your dogs and and I wonder is it an invisible fence or is there like a wire? Oh uh, the wire runs under the ground. Okay. And they have to wear a collar with a little cartridge. Okay. What, f first of all, we can have them without the collar on for months and they've long ago learned you just don't go past that part. If they have the collar on it, it beeps when they're getting close. Um, so if they're ever in hot pursuit of anything, which they've already learned where to stop. So they, they'd, um, it's been years since any of them got a shock. They get shocked like once or twice. I've gotten shocked from the collar. It's not, a, it's not an incredibly horrible thing. I don't use it for training them or anything like yeah, that. That, it, that was my main question. I do have a lot of patients and such that use it for training. And from a behaviorist standpoint, um, it does cause lots of issues with my patients. And from a medical standpoint, it causes lots of pa issues with my patients. And, and I don't mean it in any disrespect whatsoever. I, I think your lecture was absolutely fantastic, and thank you for being here. But I was wondering how, when you had talked about honoring our, our non-human counterparts with such compassion, how you would justify such things as a shot collar or something like that, because it is something, personally myself, I would struggle with putting that on my dog, who I do care so much for, and I right. do know cares so much for me. Right. Well, I, I would never shock a dog to train it. I mean, if I, if I ever thought I needed to use a shock collar for training, let's say the dog had some kind of aggressive problem. I don't even know what. But um, you, know, you can set those things down to tingle um, and make it a, like a, just a little unpleasant thing. And then they, it's like saying no really loud. It's a little unpleasant thing. I don't think that's cruel. Uh, there are very cruel people who use it in very cruel ways. Uh, in my case, it keeps our dogs safe, and um, it's well, well worth the trade-off to keep them safe. We live right along a busy road. Um, it's well, well worth that trade-off. And they, they, never, they never test it or get shocked. Um, it's interesting, when, you, when you're training little puppies with it, they're always looking to you for cues. And what they, what they tell you, which I found works, you go near the line with them on a leash with the, with the shock collar on, and you act like something is dangerous there, and you pull way back. They're already afraid of going past that point before they even hear the first beep out of the collar. They, they, get, they get a shock like once, uh, maybe twice. They know when they hear that beep, just don't go. And then they learn the borders. They run all around the yard at top speed. They chase deer out of the yard. The deer go, and they just stop. They never, they never um, yeah, I, I, don't, I think it's OK. It's, I, that's how I feel about it. Well, this, I think that uh, let's thank again Carl Safina for a fantastic lecture. All right, thank you very, very, very much.